Just going to go over some MR safety with you guys today and uh, do a brief overview of the ACR manual on MR safety. Um, just a little background on MRI. In 1970, Dr. Uh, Damanian started working on MRI and he discovered that it emits a signal that you can see abnormal tissue versus normal tissue. So two years later, he actually applied for the United States patent to MRI, and it was the very first patent for MRI. By 1977, um, Dr. Damanian had built the very first MRI machine. Uh, it's called the Abdominal. Um, it actually has been on display in the Smithsonian uh, Museum. I think it's still housed there, but I don't believe they have it on display anymore. Uh, important thing that you always want to remember about MRI safety is the magnet's always on. MRI developed very, very quickly from the time that it was FDA approved, which is in the mid 1980s. Um, at that point, by the year 2002, there was approximately 22,000 MRI scanners worldwide, and there was about 40 million MRI exams that existed in that year. Um, Flashpoint to now, last year, there were um, about 44,000 pregnancies in the United States alone and 60 million MRIs done. So it's developed very quickly, and it developed very quickly as a diagnostic tool that was well known to be perfectly safe, except for the fact that it has a very high magnetic field associated with it, which has caused a lot of problems over the years that people weren't aware of. Um, how strong is the magnetic field for an MRI scanner? Uh, average clinical MRI scanner, which is a 1.5 to a 3 Tesla magnet, is about 30 to 60,000 times the gravitational pull of the Earth. So it's an extremely strong magnet. It has the ability to pick up chairs, stretchers. Um, you see some floor buffers there that got stuck in units over the years. It's stronger than the magnets that you see in the junkyard that pull up the cars um, before they're demolished. Um, so, and deaths have resulted from MRI. Uh, these are some more things that have happened with MRI scanners. It will pick up hospital stretchers, the floor buffers, carts, um, office chairs, if you get an office chair anywhere near it at all. One of the um, most tragic accidents that ever happened in MRI actually happened in the year 2001 in July uh, in Valhalla, New York. A little boy named Michael Palomini died as a result of an MRI accident. Uh, Michael had been admitted to a hospital to have a benign brain tumor removed. And several days later, he was being discharged, and the neurosurgeon decided to order an MRI on Michael before he left. And they placed him into the magnet, and they had given him some sedation. At that point, his oxygen saturation started to drop, and the anesthesiologist started yelling for oxygen. And when that happened, the oxygen for the, in that magnet actually came through the wall from the tank that was on the back side of the wall. The tank had run out of oxygen, so it wasn't blowing any O2 for Michael. So, of course, the doctor is getting hysterical at this point because his saturations were dropping. So the two MRI technologists who were there left the anesthesiologist in the magnet room and went behind closed doors to change out the oxygen tank behind the magnet. So while they were doing that, a nurse who had visited the department earlier that day, she had left some of her personal belongings in the department. She came into the department, walked past the magnet door, heard the, radio, or heard the anesthesiologist screaming for an oxygen tank, and she handed him one. And it was a ferromagnetic oxygen tank, so when she handed it to him and he walked towards the magnet, the magnet ripped it out of his hands and went right to Michael. Um, it hit Michael in the head, going about 45 miles an hour. Um, he died three days later. They initially thought he would sustain his injuries and live, but he did not. Um, at this point in time, the ACR decided that they should probably step in and do something. So in 2001, they created what they called the Blue Ribbon Panel on MRI Safety. This was basically primarily in response to Michael Colombini's death, but it was also in response to a lot of adverse accidents that have been happening over the years with MRI. So they gathered a panel of research radiologists, practice physicians, um, MRI medical physicists, 
Uh, there's a professional architect on the committee, um, some MRI technologists, some nurses that work in the field, and they got together and they initially published an MRI manual for safety. Um, it was first released in 2002 and was actually released as the first white paper in MRI history. And then uh, one step further, the ACR in September announced that with the new release of the MRI manual for 2020, they were also going to start following up with sites who wanted to get ACR accreditation, meaning that the ACR is now standing up and saying that if you are going to apply for the ACR and get your units accredited, you must be following everything that is in the MRI safety manual. Um, unfortunately, there's a few things in that manual that are really hard for the ACR to get proof that the site is doing them. And one of those is staffing, and staffing's become a very big issue when it comes to MRI safety. The ACR wants to change that, and they're now saying that if the site has any questionable safety issues, they will come and inspect, and you should have a certain level of staffing, which we'll discuss here shortly. Uh, these are just some of the sections that are available to read about in the ACR manual on MR safety. Um, it kind of goes in the order of patients going in and out of the magnet. So it starts out with safety policies and then it discusses personnel and screening, gowning your patients and having a full stop final check, which is MRI's timeout. Um, just like surgical timeout, everybody takes a pause to double check on things. Um, there are a variety of patient population considerations when it comes to MRI safety. Um, we have some contrast agents that become a safety issue. Uh, there's risk assessments for patients that have implants or anything on them or in them that is metal or maybe an electronic device of some sort. There's monitoring for patients who are sedated, um, anesthesia patients. There's uh, the information about implants, devices, objects that are in, in the patient and on the patient. Um, there's even a setup about the MRI environment. The three uh, magnetic fields, the three energy fields that we use in MRI, the static magnetic field, the time variant radiant magnetic field, and the time variant RF magnetic field. Those are three very important energy fields that a technologist must be aware of and the radiologist must be aware of. There's information on organizational structure of your facility, how you should actually lay out the structure of safety in your department. And there's also a lot of safety designs that you can do when you're actually creating a department. So if you're gonna go under construction, there are some safety tips in the ACR manual and some recommendations on what to follow for that. And then of course, there's emergency pre preparedness, um, you know, in an area like Florida, or there's a lot of hurricanes, tornadoes, those kind of things. A lot of the magnets down here, their sites want to have a nice emergency plan in case anything happens while they're um, functioning as a department. One of the first things that the ACR discovers or discusses, excuse me, is um, MR safety policies and procedures and staffing is involved in that. Uh, the ACR recommends that every site have an MRMD. This is your magnetic resonance medical director. This is usually a radiologist, and they are responsible for the site. They're responsible for everything that happens at the site, and they're responsible for the technologist and the techs report to them. Uh, your site should have a solid plan of MRI policies and procedures. This includes adverse event reporting, which um, is actually an FDA regulation. The FDA wants you to report any adverse events. And this is for any medical, any situation in the medical field, even something if a MedRAD injector malfunctions, they report it to the FDA MedWatch program. The MRI events for MedRAD, MedWatch are listed under LNH. I've never really been able to figure out what LNH has to do with MRI, but <laughs> that's what the FDA wants. So um, that's the site actually that you go to for MedWatch and you can actually pull up any accident that's ever happened or any issues, recalls, anything like that by looking at the MedWatch, um, and it will give you information about the site and what happened and what they did as a result of that. The nice thing about the MedWatch program is it's really kind of an educational issue. Um, you know, and you can look up things that happened at other people's sites and know about them and be aware of them so that they don't happen at your site. So that's, you know, really a nice section for, um, I think, for the FDA to have. 
There's also uh, reports on uh, MR department staffing. When it comes to staffing, there's level one and level two. These are basically your safety barriers. Um, level one staff, they are safety trained in accordance to your MRMD. They can decide how the facility gets safety trained. At my facility, we watch continuously a video every year that's about an hour to an hour and a half long that goes over all of the safety issues in MRI and discusses the magnetic field and all of the dangers in the field. There's two different levels of these available. One is level one and one is level two. So your level one staff is someone who is safety trained to the point that they're not going to hurt themselves. They're not going to hurt themselves and they're not going to hurt you while they're in the field, but they don't have to be a technologist. It can be a nurse, it can be just a support staff, a triage person, some kind of an aide. So you want to have a good level of these barriers for your staffing. Your level two people are also trained as level one, so they're not going to hurt themselves and they're not going to hurt you while they're in the magnet or anywhere near the magnet, except they go one step further. The MR tech, the level two, two training is more of an MRI tech kind of position. Um, they would know about the safety of the magnetic field and everything around it, what can go in and out of it. They also will know the ins and outs of all the energy fields of the magnet so that they know a little bit more about the patient. There's a lot of thermal issues in MRI. You can create a burn if you don't know what you're doing. You can burn a patient and you can seriously hurt them. So that's your level two person. They're a little more aware of the area. Your MRMD will also fit in that category of level two. The ACR actually bases their staffing on the VA Health Administrative Directive from 2008. It's just Directive number 1105.05. And this basically discusses the staffing that you should have to efficiently run an MRI department. It discusses the level one and level two staffing. And it also lays out what level of staffing that you need to have for each magnet. So if your department currently has one magnet, you should have two people at all times. Every time there is a patient or a volunteer in the magnet, you should have two people. Um, this has become a very big issue with the ACR and a lot of sites around the country because they like to run at bare minimum. My site runs at bare minimum, but we've recently hired some tech aides to, to help with that and get onto the ACR staffing patterns, which is from the VA Health. Um, basically, if you have one MRI scanner in the area, you need two people. One of those people in there has to be a level two, which is your technologist. The other one has to be at least trained to level one. They need to be within earshot of, of each other at all times while there's a patient. And this basically just comes from the fact of all the accidents that happened over the years. Michael Colomini's death, if there had been more than these two techs. And, and the incident with Michael Colombini is kind of unique because the one tech was training the other tech. And that's why they both left the area to go in to, try to change the oxygen tank was it was a training issue. In that case, there should have been another person there that was MR safety that would have stayed with the anesthesiologist because the anesthesiologist was not safety trained at all. So the, um, the VA also discusses your formal MR safety roles, which is the MRMD, the MRSE, and the MRSO. The MRMD, of course, is what we already discussed. The MRSE is your safety expert. This is a physicist level. And the MRSO is the safety officer. The MR personnel fall in under that, so the staff techs fall in under that demotion when you're doing the staff. Every, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, this is a question. Oh, please, at any time. <laughs> so can your MRSO fill that? Yes, yes, most of the MRSO, I'm an MRSO. So, yeah. Most, because, like, with our imaging center in the hospital, and so we did do it on the giant MRSO, I just want to make sure that was appropriate. Yeah, and actually there are some MRSOs in the country that are not taxed. Um, there's really no regulation saying what it is, you know, there's forces to train to be an MRSO and then pass an exam. Yeah, right. 
Yeah, and there are uniquely there are some MRSOs that are nurses, which is I find that unique because to me an MRSO is more tech related. Right. But there are some really good radiology nurses that are also certified and some engineers actually. I have an engineer facility where I worked that was certified as an MRSO. So sure, no problem. Um, when it comes to screening, um, of course, you want to screen everybody that's going anywhere near the magnet. Um, all of your screening should actually be the same. So your screening sheet for your patients and for your staff should pretty much be identical and your processes should pretty much be identical. Um, there's just a sample here of a screening sheet. On the screening sheet for patients, of course, you would want their name and ID and a medical history and weight and those sort of things. For the employees, you can kind of get away from the weight and information that you don't need. But really, everybody should be screened for any kind of medical implants that they have on them or in them. There's a lot of diabetic pumps that people attach to them. Those kind of things we need to be aware of, internal um, implants. Those kind of things are all listed on general screening form. So you want to make sure that your screening forms are pretty solid and they pretty much match for everyone who's going in and out of the night at any time. Um, most facilities and the facility where I work at the DMR screening is part of the employee assessment, part of the um, actual interview process. When we interview our staff people, we double check to make sure that they don't have anything in them that unfortunately would classify them out of that job position that they couldn't work in the field. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the implants, there are some techs in the world that have pacemakers, diabetic pumps, those kind of things. Um, there's questions about them being safe working in the field. Um, just because when they're FDA labeled, the devices are FDA labeled in accordance to a patient, not to a tech. So it's really hard to compare the two. Um, any of the changes when it comes to staff in the screening, any changes need to be reported to the MRMD of the site. So as a technologist, if I have surgery done, it's my responsibility. I'm expected to report that to my MRMD, telling him if I have anything implanted in my body at all or anything that changes my status as a tech. Um, again, like I said, all the screening forms should be identical and your patient screening form should actually have a spot for, for a signature because ultimately what you want to do with the screening form for the patients is integrate it right into the medical records on the patient. This kind of backs the site up for any kind of legal issues that may come about on the screening. You want to make sure they can sign a form that they answered all the questions to the best of their ability. Is there a pacemaker uh, safe enough to be in the MR environment? Oh, yeah. There's a very, very large market of MR conditional pacemakers and what you do with your short time. There's uh, several different population types that the ACR talks about for patients and the process on screening those people. Your patient population types are outpatients, inpatients, um, urgent patients. A general outpatient that is walkie-talkie that comes in and out of your facility on a daily basis for their MRI follow-ups or their routine MRI appointments, these people, um, according to the ACR, should actually be screened twice. One of those screenings needs to be done by a level two person. And one of those screenings can be done either by a level one triage person or by the scheduling department. A lot of facilities, uh, when it comes to outpatients, when the outpatient schedules the MRI, makes the initial phone call to the scheduler, that scheduler will give them some, some questions to answer, like, do you have a pacemaker? Do you have aneurysm clips? Any, you know, pumps or anything like that? Um, we've uh, answered questions about allergies, general items for the schedulers to do. And then um, when the outpatient arrives at your site, they should be screened again where they're signing the form. Some places will print out that form and let the outpatient sign it. And then once the outpatient is brought back into the department, that form is done again with someone else with a level two personnel so that we know without a shadow of a doubt that there's nothing in them. Uh, I've been doing MRI for over 30 years, and I still to this day have a patient that will say they went the whole way through everybody's screening process, they get to me, I start to walk them into the magnet, and they remember something that they have. And it's never something minor. It's always like, you know what, I just forgot I have a pacemaker. 
or I have an aneurysm or metal in my eyes, you know, something like that. And it's amazing to me that it happens. The patients do it all of the time. Um, we also have a good inpatient population. Uh, the inpatients, when they're screened, they, they kind of fall out of a strange category because they're already in the hospital. So a lot of fresh exams that they're having is all available through medical records. But it's always a safe bet to screen your inpatients at least twice. Um, definitely once. Most inpatients you can get by doing it once. Maybe a phone call from a level two person. If the patient is in the room and is alert oriented enough to speak on the phone, your technologist or your nursing staff can call them on the phone and get them screened before they arrive to the department. That's a really great way of getting rid of any problems with an inpatient that may occur. Um, you know, they just might be claustrophobic. They may have something that you just can't scan, that sort of thing. So it's always nice to do that. We also have a population of unconscious altered mental status patients. If you have a patient that cannot answer the questions on their own, um, you want to look for a family member or POA. Um, if the family member can't answer questions and say that I've known this person all my life and beyond the shadow of the hell I know that you don't have anything, then you might want to report that to one of your radiologists and there's a screening x-rays that we can do. Routine screening x-rays for somebody with an altered mental status is usually head and neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and you want to check their extremities for any signs of any injury. So this would be bullet wounds or you know maybe they have a scar on their arm, just something that you might want to check to make sure. And again, um, screening x-rays, for example, if your inpatient can't answer any questions and you do a routine x-rays on them, you want to make sure that one of the techs takes a good look at the extremities and feed all of that to the radiologist to do x-rays. Sometimes they'll, they'll say it's you know just a forearm, it'll be okay. Um, so you want to make sure that you just have every patient and every population of patients solidly screened before you put them into the magnet. There's also a bunch of alternatives that you can use in there. They're kind of like a backup system. A ferromagnetic detector is one of those. Uh, you don't want to use a metal detector. You don't want to use a metal detector that the airport uses. You want to get a good ferromagnetic detector in your department. Um, and this would be a backup. Once you screen a patient, have them to go through the ferromagnetic detector as the last resort. Sometimes you change a patient into a hospital gown and they will put something in the pocket of the gown or they will stick something in their underpants. It happens all the time. We've had people that stick their cell phones behind them in their underpants. They'll stick them in their socks. So you really truly almost need to strip down a patient completely. Um, but your ferromagnetic detectors will be your backup in case they miss something. They won't miss anything. We have patients with uh they come from x-ray, they put, they use a Parkinson patient, they put the weight bands on the shoulders mm -hmm. underneath the sheets. Mm -hmm. They did the final winding on them, seen it was magnetic, got the one off, but didn't see the other one. And they put them in the board and yeah, yeah that was $75,000. Oh, yeah. But it, yeah, that little bag was this big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we tried to get it off and yeah. come along and it just, and we, we saw it on a rip. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the problem. Most of the uh, most of the weight bags, and they also have um, fitness ankle weights. Yeah. Nurses love to wear ankle weights. Um, we have an entire staff of ICU nurses, and I think probably about 95% of them wear ankle weights, and they're heavy. I had no idea they were that heavy, um, but they, and they are metal shot foot. They're usually little BBs. Um, sometimes, like the weighted blankets that they're right now sometimes are flat speeds so they're really not an issue with those but a lot of the waiting items for holding people down sandbags that they use we like radiology yeah we right. have a police officer uh custod custodial officer um is the side of my arm we got to take it off it actually went before and within probably i think it was 10 minutes it started all six rounds and all yep yeah that was cool. That was about 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, and that's happened a lot. There's been a lot of guns that. We had a cow put a spindle on a sock. You know, we got jammed on a red sock. We put a spindle on a sock. Luckily, the tech saw it before he got in the bag. Come on, come on. Yeah, he got in there and sucked my board and it heated up the rounds so hot. The powder discharged. Right, right. 
Yeah, it usually will disenable the, um, I'm, I'm sure there's a technical name for it, but it disenables the lock. So even if the officer has it locked so that it won't fire, it disenables that because it's a little magnetic um, switch in there. Well, this, was, these, this was a uh, six shooter, wasn't water. Uh, it was a six shooter. They said it just uh, yeah. stuck with the board and heated up the round. Mm -hmm. Did it um, did it hit him or no? They left the room once. Once it happened, um, they got him out of you know they moved everybody out of there. They knew, yeah, they knew what was going to happen. Right. There's actually been some officers that were shot that they had their firearm either stuck down you know in their sides somewhere. They had it in like a saw. You know they put the little straps on their legs yeah. and them up with their socks. There's actually been a few officers around the country that were shot but uh, because they just it will like fire. So you want to make sure, and, and really, if that officer had walked through any kind of paramagnetic detector, it would have been Well, this is prior to the, all the right. rest of and all the other stuff that's been right. Right. Yeah. Next thing you want to do is get on your patients. Um, you know, an MRI, and, and I've done this too. When I first started an MRI, we didn't change anybody. We put everybody in there as long as they didn't have zippers or buttons on or anything like that. I put them in the magnet, but... Really, it's very important that you strip the patients down and gown them. And oddly, you know, like I said, people will put all kinds of things in their underwear. They will, you know, women will leave their bras on and they'll stick cell phones down in there. We've had credit cards, you know, it'll ruin a credit card if you have it in, in a wallet or something. So you just want to make sure that your patients are all wearing the cotton scrubs that the hospital issues. You can get disposable cotton pants. Uh, the only bad thing about cotton scrubs is a lot of hospital systems now are putting RFID in them. So if the gallon walks away, they know where it went. The RFID tags will be up in the magnet if you're imaging that area. So you'll hurt a patient by putting them in a gallon. So you want to make sure that your facility doesn't use any of those. You want to make sure that your patient has all of their personal belongings off of them. Any devices, any jewelry. Um, people are now wearing athletic clothing. Lululemon comes to mind. They make yoga pants and, and sweat tops that are lined with copper and silver for sweat protection. There's actually been somebody who the Lululemon pants caught on fire in the magnet. It heated up the fibers. The person was having a scan and they were scanning in that area. And, and wow. yeah, so you want to really make sure, you know, people are even a mask now with COVID. People are wearing the copper, you see them advertised, you know, they're antibacterial. They're lined with copper. If you put somebody into the magnet and you're imaging their head, you're inducing RF when you use MRI. That's part of how we take pictures and you're inducing RF right into copper, which it will heat up and hurt someone. There is, when I discussed the med watch for the FDA, there was a case reported by a patient. So it's a little questionable because it was the report was written very oddly, but the woman said she had on a copper face mask and was imaged, and she actually had the burn on her face from the mask because it got so hot that it burned her. Um, so you really want to make sure that your patients are stripped down. Um, issue them a hospital mask. Most of the masks have a little metal piece in the nose. You're going to have to take that out. Even if it's not a magnetic piece of metal, it's still metal and it's still going to heat up if you're imaging in that area. So you want to be very careful with anything the patient has on. And then once you have the patient screened and ready to go in the magnet, you want to do that final full stop, final check timeout to confirm that not only are you doing a confirmation that you've got the right patient and the right body part and you have a script and everything is done, you want to make sure that they are screened appropriately, they are gowned appropriately, and all personnel that are going into the room with that patient, they are also prepared to go in. You know, a lot of sites have their techs wearing pocketless scrubs now so that they can't stick anything in their pockets. So you want to make sure that your techs are following policies as well. And the final timeout should occur with every patient. And in that way, you confirm that the whole group of people that are going into the magnet are okay to go in. There's also um, in population considerations, there's pregnant population, of course. Um, healthcare practitioners who are pregnant, they can work in and around the magnet as often as they want at any point in their pregnancy. 
there's actually no research that says that they're in danger being in that field. Um, there's never been anything reported of any accidents, um, doesn't matter what trimester of pregnancy. Many years ago, we used to not like to have someone who was in their first trimester in the magnet or working around the magnet. Um, all of that's been looked at pretty much everywhere. And of course, the ACR is recommending that too. The only thing that they recommend for the healthcare worker who's pregnant is that they do not enter the magnet while it's imaging. And that's just because there's really no research. Who, who would want to test that? You would have to test pregnant people to see if something would happen while they were in the room. So it's really not been tested. So we just avoid them standing in the room. And that's kind of an unusual situation anyway. You usually don't have anybody standing in the room while it's imaging. Um, patient populations, pregnant females, um, there's really been no doubt of it. All the data that they've tried to do has failed in showing any kind of effect on the fetus or the mother. Um, of course, you want to be cautious because they are pregnant. So you want to make sure that if you have a pregnant patient, you're taking that to a physician so that they can look at that patient's history and do a nice risk versus benefit of, of the MRI. If, if it is something that is going to hurt the mother or hurt the fetus while she's carrying the child, then you'll definitely do the MRI. If it's something that can wait, like if she's just having a pain in her ankle and it can wait until after she delivers, it's probably best to do that. Um, you also want to avoid giving the pregnant woman contrast um, just because there's not there's not a lot of data of the crossover of the fetus having the gadolinium. Um, there's a little bit that it crosses the blood-brain barrier and it will go into the fetus and circulates the amniotic fluid but you just want to make sure that you're only giving the female contrast if she really absolutely needs it. If it's something that's going to save her or save the fetus, then you would want to do that. <clears throat> There's also a safety concerns when it comes to spading patients. Um, your pediatric population is actually your highest population of patients that are going to need sedated for MRI. So you want to make sure that you are following the anesthesiology, uh, the anesthesiology society has processes on pediatric patients as well as the pediatric um, association. So you want to make sure that you're following those guidelines. Your facility should have a guideline as well as your state. State guidelines are different. You want to make sure that your facility is following any of the state guidelines when it comes to imaging pediatric patients and sedating them. Um, and this also includes adults who need sedated. You want to make sure that you're following any guidelines with them. Um, there are MRI monitors, uh, there are MRI um, injectors, blood pressure cuffs, anything that you would need for sedating a patient. There's um, anesthesiology departments are able to buy a full anesthesia cart that can go into the MRI room. Of course, you want to double check that when they buy it. My anesthesia department several years ago bought a monitor device that actually was safe to go into the room, but once it got too close to the magnet and we started taking the pictures, they were all artifacts because it was interfering with the magnet. So you want to make sure that you check anything that your outside departments like anesthesiology would purchase. Um, so you just want to make sure that you are following all of the regulations that those monitor equipment places have. You want to place the leads on the person correctly, because if you don't have the monitor wires on them lined up correctly, as the manufacturer recommends, you could injure the patient while they're in the magnet. And then there's also um, our population that I like to talk about, which is the prisoners and the parolees, because these people are kind of very unique. A prisoner, if you've got a prisoner on your schedule that's coming from a jail with a policeman, you probably want to contact the Department of Corrections before that patient shows up. Because if they show up in metal shackles, you won't be able to put them into the magnet. They do make, and I'm sure they have a technical name for them, but they look like giant strong zip ties to me. And they're plastic. Yeah, they're heavy duty zip ties and they will replace the metal shackles with those. So you want to make sure that you're telling the Department of Corrections to bring those. They don't always know about them. And most hospital facilities, to what I know of, the security guards will have them. My facility doesn't have them. So there's, you know, you would have to have the Department of Corrections bring those. And when they bring the prisoner into the department, they can change those out while they have while they have them there. Or they may choose to travel with the plastic ones on. 
The parolees are also a danger. Uh, they have the nice little ankle bracelets on, the Nova house arrest bracelets. They will heat up if you're imaging over top of them and you will ruin them. So if a prisoner comes to your model parolee that's on house arrest, if they have a monitor on them, that monitor needs to come off before the MRI. And the best bet to do is to contact that person. Usually when they schedule, they'll tell you that because they're being asked questions about metal that they have on them. You want to make sure that they come to your facility without it on them. You don't want to have your techs or anyone in your department cutting those off. Um, some states, it's actually a felony to do that. Some states, it's not. Um, but, you know, we've had over the years, I've heard of stories of people saying, well, he called his parole officer while I had him standing next to me, and they told me I could cut him off. You know, I, I hate to question people, but you don't, that's insane. you don't know who they're calling. Um, now, granted, you know, if that happens and they cut it off, the parolee is going to pay for that. They're probably going to go back to jail, so it's not going to necessarily fall on you, but why chance it? Um, and they are very hard to cut off. They're very thick and they're very hard to cut off, so you need pretty much heavy duty scissors to do it. Um, the ACR also has a manual for contrast media because we use a lot of contrast in MRI. So the ACR recommendations really pretty much fall back on their, their manual for contrast. The important things that the ACR likes to say in the ACR manual on MR safety is that any patient, if you're gonna give contrast, you need an order from a physician to do so. Um, you don't want your technologist making a decision of giving contrast or canceling the exam also. Um, in the United States, it's illegal for a technologist to make a medical decision. We are not licensed to medical physicians. So anything that we do has to be backed up by a physician decision. So if you come to my facility and I can't do things because of something in your body, because you've got metal, legally, I cannot cancel your exam. It has to go through my radiologist as a backup. So at that point, you know, we have the, we have the, authority to say to the patient, I'm sorry, I can't stand you. You have something metal in you that's not safe to run the magnet. And technically, we have to make sure our radiologist knows that we are sending this patient home because they have magnet. They have something metal in them that can't be scanned. Um, also, and I like to mention this, and it's really not mentioned in the ACR paper, but I like to mention how I'm talking about um, regulations and recommendations for MRI. In 2018, the FDI, FDA actually put out a regulation that you must be giving all of your patients a medication guide if you're giving them contrast. So any MRI contrast has a medication guide, and that is simply when you go to the pharmacy to get pills filled, they always staple a piece of paper to the, to the little bag that your pill is in. That's actually a medication guide. Most of them are regulated um, through the FDA, and they're updated through the FDA. In 2018, because of all of the adverse reactions to contrast, meaning retaining contrast, retaining gadolinium, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, which is a fibrosis disease that is known to only gadolinium, um, because of that, the FDA now regulates that. You must be giving these out to all of your outpatients. Um, the inpatients, people always say, why well, does the FDA regulate outpatients and not inpatients? The inpatient category, as far as the FDA is concerned, falls on their admission to the hospital and their signing of the consent form when they're admitted to the hospital and the responsibility of the physician who is admitting them. It's that physician's responsibility to let the patient know everything that's going to happen to them through the hospital. So the FDA considers the inpatient physician as responsible for explaining gadolinium to their inpatients. The outpatients fall out of that and all of our outpatients get a medication doc when they come in. And at my facility, we actually hand these out to every single patient, outpatient that comes in, because you never know, you might be doing a brain without contrast, and you see something and your physician says to give contrast, and at that point, legally, you would have to stop and give this to the patient. So we give it to all of our outpatients every time they come into the facility, they're given this along with a little letter that explains this. The final assessment of getting a patient into the magnet 
is always, always, always up to your physician. You always want to make sure that every risk has been discussed with the MRMD or the radiologist who's in charge that day. They are the captain of the ship and they're running your department. So if you have a patient with any questionable implants or any device on them or in them, the final decision of taking that patient in the magnet is always the responsibility of the MRMD. They are going to be the ones held responsible, God forbid something happens to that patient. So they need to be in that final assessment stage. Any of the risk with the patient, the doctor has to be aware of, and the risk include anything medical, um, thermal functioning risk. If the patient's not dressed properly, the fall on the site's physician. So again, that is also why you want to make sure that that site physician is taking care of the policies in the department so that everyone that works under them knows that this has to go through them before anything can be done. I discussed monitoring a little bit during the previous week. Um, and there are, you know, there are a lot of MR monitors on the market that you can get. You just want to make sure that you follow the restrictions of the guidelines that are on the monitoring equipment itself so that you prevent any thermal injury from happening. You can very easily hurt a patient by using something that's not approved for MR use. You want to make sure that your equipment is MR conditional and has been tested. Um, when you are monitoring the patient, though, as a nurse or a physician monitoring the patient at MRI, you should realize that it doesn't matter how much you pay for that monitoring system, you're going to get a little bit of distortion. And that can't be helped. If the magnetic field is going to distort the rhythm of the patient just slightly. So you don't ever want to solely 100% rely on that monitor to say the patient is having an issue. I mean, it will definitely tell you if they're having an issue, but you don't want to read it and record it as an EKG for that patient for that day because of the way that it's going to be a little bit distorted. You'll notice that if you put a monitor on a patient and they're laying on the MRI table, it will be reading a nice waveform. And then suddenly when you move that patient into the magnet, they're now in the magnetic field, it will go on the shelf. It will get worse when they start imaging. Usually during each sequence that's two to three minutes long, that's when you're going to get the most distortion. Pulse oximetry, by the way, is a, is a better thing, the little pulse thing to put on the finger. It's a little more dictatable as far as seeing what the distortion is. It'll, it'll pop up in a bit with that. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, so the FDA has a criteria of MRI safe labels. And these are the labels that you would want to use on any of the equipment. And you will also see these on labels of equipment that you purchase. The little green triangle is MR safe. MR safe classification means that the device has absolutely no metal. This could have a nice little sticker on it because it's a plastic cup. There's no metal in it. My glasses would be MR conditional because there's metal in it. So anything that has no metal at all is MR safe. When it comes to MR conditional, these are devices that can go into the magnetic field, but they have conditions to be able to go into the magnetic field safely. So you always want to make sure you know what those conditions are, because if you get too close with an item that's not rated to be that close to the magnet, you could hurt someone. The MR unsafe, of course, is the red circle, and everybody knows what the red circle with the cross means, no matter what. These are devices that will pose severe risk if they are into the MRI field. Every site should have a strong handheld magnet and they should have a ferromagnetic detector device. These are, um, again, recommended through the ACR. Your handheld magnet is simply just this. The little red item on the top is a strong handheld magnet and it is very powerful. If I sit in here something, if I have it in my hand and this table of metal, it's going to take it. They're very strong. You can detect a lot of superficial things with this magnet. So if your patient says, I have a piece of shrapnel right here, you can run that over it and it'll detect that it's going to move it or hurt the patient at all. 
the ferromagnetic detection device, there's a lot of them on the market. This one happens to be um, Metzelson's, and it was actually, it's common in industries right now. It's a safe scan. And that's just a little device. You turn it on, and the little section in the middle where you see the red on it is actually the detection part of the system. And that's the part that you want to rub over the patient. And you can scan a patient head to foot, just like they do in the airport, except that's not an airport screener. So, if you run that over somebody, you will find something that's on them. You will find a policeman's gun that is stuck in their ankle or anything like that. Um, cell phones that are behind a patient. We had in the ER patient one day who had a cell phone stuffed down inside his undershorts back here, and we couldn't, we wouldn't have found it if we hadn't done a wand on him. <coughs> Sometimes while your technologist has a patient in a magnet, they will typically find metal. You always have a patient that forgets that they've got something. The tech usually will see it within the first 30 seconds of imaging because we're doing a very, um, a very large localizer that shows the large area on the patient. And we're also doing a very, in order to do the very quick localizer, we're doing a localizer that's going to see more metal. So if the patient has something metal, you're going to see it on the localizer. At that point, you want to make sure that your technologists are stopping. You don't want to move the patient back out of the magnet and panic because when you put metal into the magnet, it actually will damage the person moving them in and out of the magnet very quickly. So once you have the patient into the middle of the magnet, you're seeing the metal, you want to stop and contact your physician before you do anything. Your physician will give you instructions that if you should immobilize the patient as much as you can, or if you should continue scanning, or if you should stop scanning. It really depends on what the metal is that's in the patient. And at that point, you do want to let your physician make the decision to do that. The MRI device department itself is divided into four zones. So these are your safety zones that lead up to the magnet. And these, uh, these were actually created back in 2001. And uh, most sites back then weren't designed this way. So it's really hard to create a department that is an older department to have these zones, but you need to do the best that you can when it comes to regulating that. Zone one is your general public area. If there was a magnet next to us in the room next to us, this would be considered zone one. It's freely accessible by the public. Anyone can come and go as they please into this room. There is level two is the next area. So your zone one would be your waiting room. Your zone two would be the prep area of the patients. And these are usually behind closed doors. In the next couple of slides, I actually have pictures of zones as examples. Your zone two would be your prep area for your patients, your holding area. Um, it is a restricted access area. So it would be the area that you would go to the waiting room, which is zone one, and get your patients, bring them into the, to the triage area. Once you're in the triage area, that's zone two. Zone two is restricted and supervision is needed in that zone. So anytime there's a patient in that zone, there should be someone watching them at all times. Zone three is usually the computer room or the control room of the scanner unit. Um, that is a highly restricted area also. Nobody that is not screened should ever go into zone three. This includes inspectors. If you ever have the Department of Health, the Joint Commission, anybody like that comes into your site, you want to screen them before they hit the control room because that's a regulation. Anybody who's in the control room needs to be screened. Zone four is the magnet room itself. And that's a higher level of restriction. At that point, you want to have just your level one, level two people should have access to zone four, no one else. And sometimes that includes radiologists, anesthesiologists, anybody. And that's they have a hard time understanding that, but it's just a zone restriction that needs to be there for safety. As I said, zone one is the general public area. Um, this is the access area for MRI. And really, in a hospital, zone one could be anywhere, but usually you may consider a your waiting room. This is a doorway example to zone one, and you want to make sure that it's marked, and there's a little sign up there on the corner on the left. This is MRI zone one. 
that's the area where the patients are waiting, the visitors are waiting, and the patient is filling out their assessment forms and their hospital registration forms or however your facility registers the patient. So two then is the holding area and the interface zone is patient prep area. It should be supervised at all times visually by a level two personnel. This is an example of an entry to level two. These doors are locked at all times and are usually tap go access. There's a little black panel on the wall that the employee will walk up to and tap and the doors will open for them. So at that point, once you're behind those doors, you're in a restricted area because you're getting dangerously close to the magnet. So you wanna make sure that at any time your techs are watching zone two and protecting that site. Um, this is an example of some other items that are in zone two a dressing area and a smaller waiting room. This waiting room is not for general public people. This waiting room is for people who are either already dressed and ready to go for MRI or they're, they're in and out and waiting to be assessed. And the area should usually have cameras on it so that everyone who is inside where the magnets are in the control room can see that area. Other things in zone two, would be your ferromagnetic detector, which is that wall unit that you see on the left side of the screen. And that's basically a unit that when you walk up to that, you spin in a circle and it will screen you. So you just go this way and then you lean to this way and you spin. And when that color will go off, it will go yellow and red and green. If there's metal on the patient, the green, of course, means they're clear. Level or zone two area is also a nice area. Or Yes, yeah, zone two is also a nice area to keep your CPR card in, any of your rescue equipment, monitors, those kind of things should be in that area. Zone three then is your control room. And that's actually where, even though it's the control room, that's actually where anything that's ferromagnetic can actually severely injure someone if it's on that because they can very easily access zone four at that point. So you wanna make sure that everyone who's in the control room knows that they're not supposed to go into zone four with something paramagnetic. This also comes to a lot of sites say, well, the control room can't have anything metal in it. And actually the ACR paper does say that, but it's to an extent that what it says is, things should be restricted in zone three if they have no use in that area. So in zone three, you have your control room, you've got to have computers and a phone and chairs for your staff to sit in. Those are all metal items that can't go into control into room four, into zone four, but you need them for patient care. Um, this is an example of a control room area. And if you see, there's a little black panel by, by the door to that area. And that's actually the access panel where people who are restricted have to access. They have to tap their card to unlock those doors. And this is an example of a control room. Um, and you can see there is a scanner there. Um, there's a big window for the tech to look through while they're sitting there, and there's a little computer beside them. And this is what the little computer has. That's the line of sight that the ACR recommends that your techs have. This is your level two personnel, and your level one personnel who are sitting in the control room should have a shot of the department, and this is actually my department. Um, the bottom panel left is coming in zone two's door, so I can see at any time who is coming through those doors. I also have a button in my control room that opens those doors. So when someone comes, they pick up the little phone on the wall, they tell me who they are and why, why they need in, and I let them in. And then I can watch them come into an apartment. I can watch who's sitting in the waiting area, so I know where they're going at all times, and I can watch patients who are also in my holding area, and that's our nurse's station. We can watch people who are at our nurse's station and make sure that they're not coming and going freely into the department. So we actually have a camera view on everything in the department. Scan, zone four is actually your scan room and that's a highly restricted zone. You don't want anybody not screened ever going near zone four. You saw the visual signs back um, on the other screen that I just showed. There's also um, magnet is always on signs on the doorway for zone four so that everyone knows. There's usually a, a door frame above the head that has magnet that's always on. Those are restricted to your site should have one of those at all times on all of the magnets. And that needs to be actually hooked up to the auxiliary power of the facility. So that if there's ever a power outage in a facility, that magnet is always on sign stays lit. 
this is just an area of zone four. This is an example for you for the scan room. It should be clearly marked as zone four so no one goes in there. Um, usually there's, there's a nice stop sign on the door or something red to get people's attention. People don't read signs. None of us read signs. That's why people walk in and out of places they're not supposed to be all of the time. But if you see a big red sign like that, a big red stop sign, a big red bar, you, you can probably stop. The doors to zone four should also, also be locked. So they should only be accessed by staff. They should be in there. Um, things to avoid are combination locks. Um, you know, the little keypads, people like to write the combination on the door frames. So you want to avoid that, which is why we have those little panels that are the electronic key that actually tap people in and all of our doors in my apartment actually have that. And that's what you see down here is that little red light right there just means that it's functioning. And if I tap my employee card, it'll go green and then it will open the door for me. There's also an emergency stop button so that I can override that door because once I pull that door shut, it locks the patient into the magnet. So if something happens to that patient, you need to have an emergency stop button to get in there very quickly. And some people in a panic don't think about tapping their card fast enough. So if you hit that stop sign, it, the alarms, it'll drop the doors and unlock them so you can get your patient. In the middle is an example of the MRI room itself, and that's the scanner in there. And that yellow black line you see around the floor, your joint commission inspectors will love to see that, but really, um, no, no offense to them, they don't know what it is. Um, basically, that marks the line where your monitors and your ventilators, anything like that, that's the line that they can't get any closer than that. I'm sorry, yellow one. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And um, your maintenance facility or your engineer, whoever's running your, your equipment and repairing it, will know where to put those lines based on the equipment. Um, sometimes they put a little square. One of my rooms has a little square, and that's actually where they park the ventilator. Um, if you put the ventilator past that line, it will probably start to move towards the magnet because it's probably MR conditional to a certain point. And that's why you want to make sure that when you have MR conditional equipment in your department, you know the range of where it can go. Most of them, most things, um, some of the uh, medication pumps that they make, the Arata Med makes one, for example, it can go right up against the board of the magnet, but a lot of your ventilator manufacturers, it has to stay behind that line. Um, it will not function correctly or it will move towards the magnet. We actually do get one of our stuff on the side, so it is magnetic if you get up too close. You also want to make sure that your site um, knows how to have an emergency in the department. You want to make sure that you practice your code responses. You don't ever, ever want to run a code in the scanner room. What you need to do is if your patient is in the scan room having an exam, you need to do some kind of basic life support until you get them out of the room, be it another technologist on the table doing CPR or whatever it is. You need to get them out of that room because you cannot have a crash cart that goes in there. You can't have emergency equipment running in there. You know, there's been some codes um, across the country that people have gone running into the MRI room with scissors and stethoscopes and everything else. And it makes more of an emergency at that point because then you've got people's equipment flying. So you want to make sure that your techs are trained enough to know that they need to get that patient out of there and work the code out of that room. You also need to know that there is a zone protection at that point. When we have a code in the department and you are getting your text out, you want to make sure that there's someone else in the department who shuts the door of the scanner so that the code team doesn't accidentally run in there for some reason. Uh, you also want to make sure, like in my department, you can't, your, your general hospital people don't have access to the MRI department. You don't give your code team access because they are not our safety trained. Someone's got to open the doors to zone two to let the code team into the department. So you need to make sure that either your security guards who might be coming to answer the code, or you have additional staff, even your secretaries or someone is trained that if a code goes off, someone goes and mans the doors to let the code team in. So it's always a good idea to run a lock code in your department just to see how quickly you can support and get the patient out of the magnet and into the response area and have all of the zones protected at the same time, which also comes back to the ACR regulations on staffing. If you've only got one tech in that area, you're just setting yourself up. You're either going to hurt them or you're going to hurt the patient. 
because it's just not safe to let them alone at any time. You also want to make sure that um, you are training your fire departments, police, and security in your hospital. In my hospital, I routinely do maintenance and security in services every year. They get the same in service. And I, I know that sounds silly, but in 12 months' time, people completely forget that the magnet's always on and that they can't do certain things in that magnet. So you always want to make sure that you train your police and security that are going to be answering any issues in your department. If you have a fire overnight in your MRI department, you want to make sure that whoever is responsible for emergency at your facility, if it's maintenance, if it's security, or a local fire department, if it's a freestanding facility, you want to make sure that they have a contact person because you don't want a fireman running into the magnet. There was an accident there many years ago, probably 15, 20 years ago, on Interstate 80 in Pennsylvania, not far from where I live, and a trucker went off the highway in a snowstorm and crashed right into an MRI department. He crashed right into the right into the magnet. He drove his rig the whole way into the magnet, and the facility didn't have any safety issues in, in effect as far as contacting someone in the middle of the night. So all of the emergency response teams to this truck accident went running into the magnet with all of their apps, their fire extinguishing stuff, um, the policemen, the firemen. So they had more of a mess because then everything was attracted to that magnet. It damaged all of the power in the facility. The rig hit the building very hard. And he took down the power supply to the building. The magnet was still on. So it, at that point, it couldn't even be turned off because of the design of the facility. So they really had a very huge accident going on at that point because the rig of the truck was in the magnet and no one could rescue the person who was in the truck because they couldn't get into the magnet because the field was up. So eventually the power, they, they got that magnet ramped out and they could, they could rescue anything. Unfortunately, the truck driver was dead on impact, but had he been alive, they would have had a hard time rescuing him because of the field. So you wanna make sure that your local police, local security, firemen, anybody who's going to be answering an emergency in your department is safety and service so that they at least know what to do in the middle of the night if there's a fire or what they can't and can't take it. There's a lot of hazards in clinical magnets right now run on cryogens. The cryogens keep them cool. If the cryogens quench during a fire, it will be a fire hazard itself. So, and it will be an asphyxiation frostbite hazard because of the chemicals in cryogens. And I'll talk about that shortly. Um, we actually, our fire department in the city of Pittsburgh, where I live, um, the fire department is, is the city's. So if we would have a fire at my facility and we have had fires, um, and I've gotten called in the middle of the night to come in with the fire department, um, myself and another manager in our system several years ago trained the entire fire department of the city of Pittsburgh, and I was stunned. There was 700 fire people, fire men that we, we trained, and they do like a yearly training, just like a medical facility, they have like yearly continuing education that they have to do and the city of Pittsburgh actually granted us that we could train them every year with these training. So we show them a little tape and teach them about the magnet in case they ever have to come and um, help any of us with a fire. I've never had a fire magnet and I hope I never do. <laughs> There's a lot of um, complex MRI settings out there and the ACR just has a very quick little um, couple of paragraphs about that. You know, when I first started doing MRI, there was basically MRI that was mobile. Um, a lot of facilities didn't have in-house magnets because they were too expensive at that time. But now we have magnets that are also a PET magnet. So there's PET MR, there's interoperative MRI, and there's also interventional MRI. So they do a lot of biopsies and things, There's and they do surgeries while they do MRI. That opens the whole new thing to safety at that point. So you want to make sure that if your OR gets a magnet, you have a staff trained properly because at that point, not only do you have MRI staff in there, you've got operating room staff and anesthesiologists and people um, who are not retrained or routinely trained in MR safety. So you want to make sure that if you have an MRMD at your site, he becomes aware of that OR magnet that you're installing or biopsy magnet different that you're making just because of the complex environment that's involved. 
Um, with the OR magnets, the weird thing about those magnets, the way they're designed in the OR suites is at any time your zone could change because sometimes the magnet will move in and out, sometimes it's on a pulley system and it comes out into the, into the surgical suite. And at that point, your zone may change. So zone three and four may be interchangeable at any time during the surgery. So you really want to make sure that you've got the right staff in that and they're trained appropriately to be in that facility. Um, we also have seven Tesla magnets now on the market that are being used for clinical and research. So seven Tesla magnets put a whole new, a whole new safety plan in because a lot of the implants are not tested for seven Tesla. They're not, they're tested for clinical magnets, which is usually 1.5 or 3T. So if you get a 7T magnet in your area, you're gonna have a whole new game to play when it comes to viral effects from the field and implants. You know, there's a lot of things you just need to know about the 7 Tesla environment. You know, there's some nausea that occurs and some dizziness with certain people. You wanna be aware of all of that before you get those magnets. And of course, make sure you have the safety trained stuff. Um, there's also a mention in the ACR, I'm sure if any of your texts, this is important for you, but as a director, you should just be aware of it. Um, there are actually three energy fields in MRI. There's the static magnetic field, there's a time varying gradient magnetic field, and then there's an RF field. The static magnetic field is basically what's noted on your MRI conditional um, list. When you look at a device that you want to take into the magnet, it will have something about the static magnetic field. Your static magnetic field is the magnetic field of the magnet. It's a 1.5 Tesla, it's a 3 Tesla, it's a 1.0 Tesla. That's your, that's your static magnetic field. There's also a, a static magnetic field gradient, which is actually the range of the magnetic field on that 1.5 system. So you wanna know where your maximum is. Your maximum static magnetic field is a 1.5 T, for example. The maximum static magnetic field gradient will vary in that 1.5 Tesla magnet. And it's usually the strongest point is that the huge opening of the bore. Just as you go into the bore, that part right there is the strongest part of your static magnetic field. Once the patient starts to move into the magnet and they get to isocenter, it's, it's dead at that point. There are no translational forces at isocenter which if you've ever watched on YouTube or if you're familiar with Dr. Pinnell's MRI tapes, he has a magnetic um, tennis ball that he puts into the magnet. And at the beginning of the bore, it takes it right out of his hand and flies it into the magnet and then bumps around. And then all of a sudden, it stops. It reached isocenter and at that point, there's no force on it whatsoever. So it's sitting right in the field. And that is the area that is the area that we image. So when you put your patient in that part of the board, that very strongest part out there is what you want to avoid with certain implants. So that's why you need to be aware of where your step field gradient is. Your engineers that install your equipment, GE, Siemens, whatever you have, they have a map for their field. They'll be able to tell you exactly where it is. But on all of the clinical magnets, it's that opening of the board is where the strongest part is. So you just want to make sure that you know that. There's also a spatial field gradient, and that's basically just the change in the distance of the magnetic field. The, the more you walk towards the magnet, the closer you're getting, the faster you're moving, the more you're going to be affected by it. This, is, this comes into high school physics, lens forces, Faraday's law, lens law. You know, Faraday's law states that if you put a wire or a metal piece of metal into the magnet, you're going to make a current and make a voltage. Lens backs that up to Faraday and says that not only are you making that magnet and that current, you're also at that point making a magnetic field. So you're making an additional magnetic field. So you need to be aware of that because at some point those two will interact with each other. And the best way to do that, it kind of sounds silly, is if you take a big aluminum pizza pan and you run into the magnet, it's certainly not magnetic because it's aluminum, but if you take it and you run like you're Captain America with a shield in front of you, when you run full force into that room, you're gonna hit something. It's probably gonna knock you off your feet. When it knocks you off your feet, that's lens forces. That's lens forces fighting the magnet. Two magnetic fields are fighting each other at that point. 
So you want to be aware of where all of those points in your room are because it's a safety issue when you're dealing with taking patients in and out of that room. If you have a patient in there and you accidentally see an implant while you're doing that localizer, you need to know where all of these are because sometimes it's more dangerous to move the patient out. Magnetic fields are three dimensional. So if you have a patient in the magnet, this happened at my facility, I hate to admit it, but about 10 years ago, we got a patient in our magnet that had an aneurysm foot. We saw it in the localizer and we panicked, but we knew at that point we needed somebody call a radiologist who checked on the patient. We made sure he was okay and wasn't moving. And we basically told him in a calm, cool, collective voice that we're just having the doctor take a look at the images that we've taken so far. Are you okay so far? And he was okay to talk to us. And at that point, we knew we couldn't move him because if we did, we would probably cause more damage. When you have that happen with a patient and your techs need to know where all these fields are because when they remove that patient from the magnet, you need to do it very slowly because the quicker you move him through that field, the more you're increasing the energy and you can actually severely hurt them by taking them out. Once you get them out of the board of the magnet, the last thing that you want to do is sit them up and run them out of the room because the magnetic field is three-dimensional. It's going around the magnet in all directions. So if you take a person out with the aneurysm foot and you pull them the whole way out, you need to take them the whole way as far as you can get away from the magnet and then bend them to get them out of the room. So if my magnet table is coming here, I want to back them as far as I can before get them out of the room because you're going to torque them in the field and that can do more damage if they have something ferromagnetic in them. The other part of the field that we're dealing with with the energy is the time varying gradient field. And this is actually the phantom noise that you hear. We are inducing a voltage. We are quickly moving gradients when we're taking MRI. In fact, they are moving so quickly that really it goes from ISO center of the patient. So it would be here with my arms going like this, going so quickly that you can't see my arms. At that point, that time variant energy field is creating a voltage and that's how we get our pictures. We use RF coils and that's how we generate our images when they're combined with a computer system. <laughs> that time varying gradient field is very dangerous for wires. Any implant, if somebody has a wire that someone left and you have a pacemaker that was removed and they still have a wire in them, that time varying gradient magnet is going to shape that wire. It's going to move it as quickly as it's moving and at that point it's gonna heat it up is connected to the patient's heart. You don't want to do that. So you want to make sure that you know where your time varying gradient field is. You can certainly image someone with a wire in them. You just need to know where it is and what it's doing and how long it is. How long it is is dependent on the static magnetic field. Some wires are very short, some are very long. And depending on your field strength, you may be able to do that. But you need to know where those are and you need to have a level two trained doctor that can tell you if it's safe or not. There's also a lot of auditory considerations because at that point in time, varying gradients are making that horrendous knocking noise that you hear. If you pull everything off of the magnet while it's running the plastic shield, you can actually see the gradients moving, the big wiring through there. You can actually see them shaking and vibrating and moving when they're making the noise. So you wanna make sure all of your patients have earplugs. The um, IEC standard is a noise standard. It's 99 decibels. And your magnet is pretty loud. Some of the more clinical magnets, some of the 3Ts are really loud. The 7Ts are very loud also. Um, and also some of your sequences are quieter than others, but you need to know that level. And so you need to make sure that you are purchasing earplugs in your department that are capable of blocking out that noise. Um, you can, and there's been reported patients who have actually lost their hearing from being in a magnet. So you want to make sure that you protect your patient and your staff. If your staff is standing in the room, they should be wearing earplugs if they're staying in there during the patient. Sometimes we have to hold a patient. Our body will scan and we're holding the patient's feet. You should have earplugs in because your ears will ring when you're done. There's also the RF magnetic field, and this is where the RF field producing burns. So this is where you hear about, I burn my patient, I don't know how. It comes from inducing RF into the patient. So there's a lot of thermal considerations that your techs and your doctors should know about. There's measurements on that. There's SAR and SED. 
SAR is your specific absorption rate, and that's actually telling you how much energy you're putting, how much energy the patient is, is absorbing. It's, a, it's an actual kind of a guess. So it will give you an idea of what is going into your patient, but it's not exact. And there's much more technical, physical things that your physicians and your technologists need to know. But SAR is your estimate of how much, uh, how much of the dosage your patient is absorbing. And the same with the S and D, which is more of an exact energy dose. Um, there's also standards based on that. There's manufacturer limitations. Some of your newer manufacturers, but they're with their better systems are actually starting to limit the energy you can put into a patient. So you can't put that in, you might be able to do a three hour exam and then it will lock you out from doing that patient for the rest of the day for the next 24 hours because you're giving that patient so much energy and so much thermal load and some, and, and this really comes in, the manufacturers are trying to limit burns that are, that are happening with thermal load patients. So there's a lot of things that you should consider when you're running the magnet in your text with the load and RF. RF can be a very dangerous thing. RF is what your coils are. The coils that we use for a patient when we do a head, we put them into a, to a head coil. That is a radio frequency coil. It is putting radio frequencies into that patient. It's transmitting, receiving, or transmitting and receiving. And your text need to know the difference between the two of them so that they know what they're inducing into the patient and how to avoid it, especially if the patient has an implant of some sort. Large caliper loops, you can actually make a curve with your patient. If you're scanning a patient, the last thing you want to do is cross their legs. You don't want to ever make a loop. You don't want to have a patient like this. You, sometimes you can burn somebody, depending on what you're doing, if they're touching their fingers, they're making a loop and they're putting a loop into that eye. So they're making a current and making a voltage. And the actual patient can make a voltage and make a loop. So you want to make sure when you're, if you're a director in your department and your techs are spending a lot of money with padding, you want to make sure that you know that that's an okay thing to do. You want to pad anything in the patient. You want to pad them from the size of the magnet because of the RF. You're heating them up when you're imaging. And the last thing you want to do is have them leaning up against the side of the magnet because they're making a loop at that point and they're making it worse. And they're going to get burned. I've seen some pretty severe burns. I mean, people have been third degree burns and had that plastic surgery as a result. Have you ever had the patient said to know that something is burning? Have I ever? Like, heard a patient said, like, that it smells like something burning. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, um, actually, yeah. We, you know, we've had some electronic things happen with the magnet. Um, one of our little control panels on the magnet actually heated up one day, and it was just like an electrical fire. But the patient smelled the smoke. Um, I've actually, when I first started doing MRI many, many years ago, um, we had a patient who got burned. Um, he burned his shoulder. We were scanning his shoulder, and something happened in the coil, and it actually arced. You can see an electrical current that occurred because it malfunctioned. So at that point, you want to make sure that your patient is protected, obviously, and that's why you want to have a gown on them because if they've got regular clothing on, it's probably worse, especially nowadays with all of the metal fibers in there. You also want to make sure that you're padding them. You're padding anything that could make a loop. Someone who's larger and has larger thighs, when they're laying in the magnet, their thighs are kissing, you can cause a burn because they're making a loop. So you want to make sure that you're padding everywhere you can. You want to pad the patient on the side. You want to pad them this direction. There's also a lot of um, the RF considerations with unresponsive patients. You want to make sure that if your patient is unresponsive, that you are, that you've got yourself padded and safely so that you can do the patient when they, they aren't able to tell you if they're burning and they aren't able to tell you if you're injuring them. We discussed the um, conductive clothing. There's a lot of conductive clothing on the market right now. You also want to watch out for anything that the patient has on them, skin staples, multiple implants like I've been discussing. Tattoos, sometimes the tattoo ink is metal. It's got a nice silky shine to it. You want to make sure that if the patient has a tattoo in the area that you're imaging, you may want to either Give them an ice pack on there to so that you're not heating them up. Your doctor might want to avoid imaging the area that they've ordered because of the tattoo. Drug delivery patches, you know, patients have um, 
you know, the um, nicotine patches on them or medication patches. You want to make sure that it's not in an area that you're aging because you're inducing RF and you're heating that patch at that point. If you heat up a, a fentanyl patch, it actually delivers the fentanyl at a different rate into the patient because of the heat. It's the same thing that these, they warn the patients not to sit in the sun. It's kind of the same thing as sitting in the sun too long. There's uh, organizational structure and safety management information, which we already discussed. But just a brief summary of it. You want to make sure that you have an MRMD. And then you want to make sure that you have a safety officer and a safety expert. The expert doesn't need to necessarily work for your facility. They might be a consult. Where I work, we actually use Pitt, the University of Pittsburgh. Um, we use their physics team for radiation and for MRI. You want to make sure that you have everybody trained level one, level two, and non-personnel. Um, do not get access to the magnet unless someone is with them. The MRMD, these are just some of their responsibilities. They are responsible for the entire site. They're responsible for all of the safety execution, all of the policies, procedures. They're responsible for appointing the MRSO and the MRFC. Um, they're responsible for QA programs. Adverse events should be reported to them. Within 24 hours, your tech should report an accident to their MRMD. The MRSO for the safety officer should be available to the site 24 7. They should always be available for the techs to call them. They work alongside with the MRMD as far as doing policies, procedures, updating. Anytime you get new equipment in your department, you should take a look at your policies. If you change from a 1.5 Tesla to a 3 Tesla, you should read over your safety policies to make sure that everything is covered. Your MRSO is also responsible for doing the safety education for the staff, like standing up here and teaching them about MR safety. Your MRSO should do that. You should also have documentation in your department for the Joint Commission. They'll want competencies of safety for all of your staff. And you should also be able to have root cause analysis done. If you have an accident in your facility, you should do a root cause analysis and keep it on file. It's a great learning thing. A lot of things we've learned over the years when I discussed Michael Palmavini, we've learned so much since Michael died as to how to run an MRI department. So you want to make sure that you use that as a learning tool for your department. Your MRSC, that's more of a physicist role. And that's really just somebody to consult if you need something highly technical about the magnet or any safety or any expertise as far as the magnetic field and the details of the physics sense of the magnetic field. You should also have your physic, you should also have someone that helps you design the department, a professional, a professional architect, so that you can go over a lot of the equipment and the vendor templates, um, patient interviewing areas. You want to make sure that your department is designed so that your workflow is easily done. And you do that with um, doing professionals, involve your techs, involve your MRSOs, MRMDs on how to design your department. There's also a professional architect places that you can hire to help you design the department because you want to make sure that you can correct and zone your department for safety. There's also, um, they have, I mean, the manufacturer can help you a lot um, when it comes to anything for zone three and zone four, which is your computer room, your control room and your scan room. Uh, here's an example again of the zone two, and you want to make sure that you have a good area to work your emergencies in. So you want to make sure you have a zone that's actually away from the magnet so that nobody goes anywhere near the magnet while they're doing the CPR or any kind of resuscitation on patients. Uh, there's a lot of potential side effects of safety issues when it comes to cryogen with superconducting magnets. So you want to make sure that your site engineers are very aware of the cryogen safety and your techs are aware of it too. If your magnet quenches, you don't want to run into that room. There's asphyxiation or frostbite issues with cryogens. You want to mark your cryogens correctly. If you've ever looked at a clinical magnet, there's a big stack coming out of the top of the magnet. And that's actually the ventilation system for if the cryogens ever drop, they will go out through that stack and out of your facility. When they go out of your facility, the area that they go out of, be it on the roof, on the side of the building, whatever, needs to be marked as zone three because it is a danger zone. If someone is standing by that pipe when your magnet quenches, they're probably going to die. They're going to have asphyxiation. They're going to have frostbite. So you don't want anything by it. 
very cold and very much gas. When cryogen starts to break down and releases, it expands. It will blow out the room. Sometimes you'll see magnet rooms that the magnets quench. There's cracks in the ceiling walls because of the pressure it creates in the room. It creates pressure to lock the doors. You know, yeah, exactly. It will lock the doors of your scanner. It will it will prevent anybody from going into that room. So you want to make sure. Exactly. <laughs> and you want to open conditional markings on your floor and on your devices. You want to make sure that any device that's coming into your apartment is appropriately marked for the static magnetic field, where it can go and where it can't go. You want to make sure your floors are marked so that your staff knows where to put their equipment. Sometimes they make tether hooks where they will tether. If you need to tether your general anesthesia to the wall because it can't go into the magnet, you need to do that for safety. And your engineers in your hospital and your, and your manufacturing engineers can help you with that. This is just an example, again, of the um, scan room with the, gut, with the ISO Gulf lines marked for the equipment. And this is an example of an arrival med, med pump. And the only reason I took that picture was for the MR conditional labeling that's actually on the magnet. It's on the back of a, on the back of a pump telling you where it can go in the magnetic field, but it can also, it will also um, tell you in the manufacturer's um, documentation where it can go. Yeah, <laughs> and actually um, our pump, and I didn't notice this until I took that picture one day, someone um, took the stickers out of my office and they put them on that pump and they put the wrong sticker on it. So that's a great example of the wrong sticker being on that pump right under the number six is a great sticker. That pump is MR conditional, it's not MR safe, it's metal, it's obviously not metal. It's... Did I? Okay. Yeah. You do look a little familiar. I worked on one X. Oh, okay. Y'all were looking at oncology, putting the overhead yeah. panels in mm -hmm. on the oncology side. Yep. The same. So I'm like, oh, that was probably. Yeah. Our, right. our yeah. oncology department was part of the MRI. It was back on the bus. It's gone now. Yeah. 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 You also want to make sure that your facility has any emergency um, guidelines to follow water damage, structural damage, power outages, quenches, codes. Um, you know, you want to make sure that if you have a lot of, if you're in a flooding area, you want to make sure that you've got a good water damage um, system. You want to make sure that if, if you're expecting a flood, you're trying to you get some of the equipment out of the way. MRI scanners are very sensitive. They're very sensitive to water damage. They're very sensitive to motion damage. So if you live in an earthquake zone, you want to be prepared for that and have a disaster plan. If your magnet survives an earthquake, you're very lucky because usually it's going to probably spontaneously quench from the, from the motion of the magnet itself. You will have a lot of issues with it. So this is just a link to the actual 2020 um, ACR manual on safety. You can pull it up on the ACR website to read it. Um, it's very long. Um, has a lot of details in it, though. It's an excellent document just to design your department solidly. And this is just my little ending here. Um, where are we now with MR safety? Well, it's in July this year, it'll be 20 years since Michael died. Um, unfortunately, we still have a lot of accidents. Have accidents all the time, daily, weekly, monthly. They're happening all the time. We have virtually no state regulations. Um, ironically, I noticed in the state of Florida, you do not have to be certified as an MRI tech to run an MRI scanner in this state. They don't recognize it. I purchased an RT. I'm actually looking for jobs to relocate. So I purchased an RT license in this state. They don't have you purchase an MR license in this state. You can run it being an RT. In Pennsylvania, you can run it being an RT, but you've got to get board eligible. So at some point, you have to become an R certified to run the magnet. So really, you know, in the last 20 years, we've gotten far, but we haven't gotten far. We're just getting knocked backwards again. So there's virtually no state regulations and there's no federal regulations. Not only are there no federal regulations on who can run the night, but there's really no federal regulations on staffing or anything on safety. It's all been recommendations. Um, this is a graph actually from a good friend of mine, Toby Gill. Um, Toby is a fantastic safety um, resource. I use him all the time. Um, he is actually part of, I can't remember the name of him. He has Gilk Radiology Consultants, so he's a consultant that you can hire. 
Um, and Toby nicely tracks MRI accidents versus volume for us. And this is MRI from 2000 to 2020, and it came off of MOD, which is actually the MedWatch FDA. The red line is accidents, and the blue line is MRI volume in the United States. So that's adverse events versus volume of MRI. And as you notice through the years, it is usually way higher than the volume of patients that we're doing. That one year in 2004, I can't figure out what happened. We actually did more patients than adverse events that were reported, but we're really, we're not getting very far. Um, but it may also have to do with the fact that now there are more people following the recommendations from the ACR, which says that if you have an accident, you should report it. Most sites don't like to report their accidents, but if you report your accident, then I need to do it because I might read about your accident and design my department that it will prevent my department from having that. So you're really saving somebody from having an accident. Um, the Joint Commission, don't have any regulations when it comes to MRI safety. A few years ago, I went through a joint commission inspector in my facility, and they actually high-fived me when they saw the lines that we taped on the floor for the magnet. And those lines don't have anything to do with regulation. It has to do with the equipment that goes into the room, but the joint commission was so excited to see those lines on the floor. And it's because they don't really have any standards or any restrictions to go by. So when they see those lines, they assume your site is safe. And at that point, they walk out and say, congratulations, you passed. They're also very concerned about the, wow, the tag that's on your fire extinguishers in your department. The MR conditional fire extinguishers are MR conditional, which means they're not going to be a projectile. They do have metal on them. If you add a little wire to hold the inspection tag on, you're doing nothing to that extinguisher. You're not making it a projectile. But the Joint Commission, they want to see plastic holding the tag onto the extinguisher just because they don't really have any restrictions of telling them what to tell you. Exactly, and right, you know, and they will. They will come into your department and beeline for your fire extinguisher, um, you know. And so, but basically when it comes to MR safety, where we stand right now is we're still trying to get some safety regulations in place. And that's where the ACR manual comes into play and how important it is to actually go by those recommendations recommendations that they have. There's also a lot of professional bodies right now that are making our safety a better place to be. Um, and people laugh when you tell them there's Facebook safety groups, but there are two Facebook safety groups. One um, vented out of actually Toby started the one in the United States and Barbara started the one in the UK and they both have about 25 to 30,000 people from all over the world on it. It is a fantastic resource for MR safety. The ABMRS, which is the American Board of Magnetic Resonance Safety, is the people who created the certifications, the MRSO, the MRSE, and the MRMD. It's Dr. Emmanuel Canal. He started it in 2014. He's now traveling the world teaching people MR safety and getting their sites up to standard when it comes to MRI um, policies, procedures, and that structural organization that you need. As far as being a director or an administrator in your site, the best thing that you can do is make sure that someone is always evaluating your MR policies and make sure that you're meeting current site practices in your policies and procedures and that you're listening to the MR staff as far as professionals to study on the facility. That's everything I have.